Hello and welcome to Inside Music, episode number 140. I'm your host, James Shotwell, and it's great to be with you again. My guest this week is none other than James Rhodes, the head of Fixed Records, who's back on the show to tell us what has changed in his life over the last year and give us a brief glimpse of what's to come in the music business in 2019. Now, James doesn't have all the answers, neither do I, neither does anyone really. We're all just making guesses, but James has been around long enough to know how trends can affect the industry, what's going to stick, what's not going to stick, and really has a good sense for how things are moving at any given point in time. Now, that's not all he's here to discuss. Life has changed a lot for James since his last appearance on the show, which I believe was sometime during the early half of 2018. Since then, Fixed Records has moved their headquarters from the Midwest out to Los Angeles, something that we discuss in length here. And with it, James's life has kind of been turned upside down, just like the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air without the cool aunt and uncle and definitely without all the money, because after all, this is the music business. James tells me a little bit about all of this and a whole lot more, so stick around and make sure you enjoy that. But first, I want to tell you a few quick things. This episode of Inside Music and all episodes of Inside Music are brought to you by Holix, the music industry's leading digital promotional distribution company. Now what that means is that Holix works with record labels, management, publicists, and independent artists from all over the world to share new and unreleased music without fear of piracy. To learn how they do this and gain access to a free 30-day trial, visit holix.com. That's H-A-U-L-I-X.com. I also want to encourage you to follow the company on Twitter. There you will find updates about this podcast as well as a bunch of advice for navigating the modern music industry and news related to the trends that James and I will be discussing in this episode. You can do that at, at holix. That's H-A-U-L-I-X on Twitter. You should also be looking at Inside Music on YouTube. Yes, we're also on YouTube because clearly no one can get enough of us. And you can find every episode of the show there, including this one, uploaded weekly, as well as original content hosted by yours truly. So if you've been listening to the show for the last three or four years, and you've spent the hundred plus hours listening to me, and you've always been like, what does that guy look like? You can find out now by heading over to YouTube and typing in Music Biz. That's Music biz b-i-z or you can just search inside music podcast either way you will find our channel subscribe and you will get content aplenty now james isn't really a artist himself so i don't really have much to plug but i do want to encourage you to check out fixed record that's f-i-x-t records they have cell dweller the annex and many other great artists who are producing really cutting edge electronic music but also have soundtracked some of your favorite video games if you're a big call of duty person or you know someone who is They're probably a fan of fixed records and they don't even realize it because a lot of those games are soundtracked by the people that you're going to hear talked about on the show today. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. That's great, man. Well, I'm glad that things are going well in your life right now, or at least it seems like it is. How is 2019 shaping up for Fixed? A really good so far. We've got you know, a lot on the release schedule. We launched a new label division a few months ago called Fixed Neon, and that's for all of our like synth wave, synth pop, indie pop. So like we took Scandroid, Sunset Neon, Uh, and move them off of the main fixed roster, which is really known for like the electronic rock sound. And then all of our 80s synthwave kind of stuff is now under fixed neon. And we just announced uh, Fury Weekend and a project called Three Force to that roster. And then we've got three new artists already signed that we haven't announced publicly yet. Uh, um, When will this air, do you think? We'll probably get out in the next couple of days easily. I've already kind of recorded the intro to the show. Some days, some days it works the other way around if I don't know what I'm going to talk to the person about, but I know that we are kind of yeah. going into this with an idea of like general life updates and business updates and stuff. Yeah. So it was pretty easy to knock out the intro. So really I just plug the audio in and do some editing out of all the little gaps and then it'll be out there. So it'll cool. be out this week, no question. So later this this week uh, on Thursday, although we, we did drop a teaser somewhere for people that are watching um, a couple of teasers, but we'll be announcing the Bad Dreamers as a new artist on Fix Neon uh, here in just a few days. So they uh, it's a synthwave project from a Grammy-nominated 
an artist named David Schuler, and he's a two-time Grammy uh, nominated artist. And this is his uh, 80s project called The Bad Dreamers. And it got uh, listed in two different top 10 uh, 2018 uh, lists. So New Retro Wave named one of his songs the number one track of 2018. And then a big synth wave blog and uh, influencer named Iron Skullet named, uh, named him as, as The Bad Dreamers as number one artist in one of his year-end 2018 lists. So um, we're re-releasing his debut album that came out independently a few months ago, and it'll be out through Fix the Yon here in January. Now, was it hard to make the decision to do this fixed neon idea? Like, when did that come about? I know you talked a little bit briefly at the top about, you know, separating them into two categories, but what was, I guess, the driving factor in that decision? And then, like, tell me a little bit about finding that perfect name. Well, it's, uh, man, it's been something we've debated off and on for a while. We really developed a name and a brand for Fix to be this all electronic rock kind of aggressive high energy thing that people know you know Seldweller, Blue Stolly, Circle of Dust um, and those artists and then we had Clayton who is Seldweller had a side project Scandroid that was this 80s synthwave thing and Blue Stolly had a side project named Sunset Neon that was also an 80s synthwave thing and we were like you know we really had an opportunity in the marketplace a lot of artists that are in that scene were looking at, you know, could they work with Fixed? And we weren't really thinking we were going to sign any other artists in those genres. They were just happened to be side projects of artists that were already working with us. So then it was like, well, there's a big opportunity here uh, for us to, to do something bigger in that scene, but it doesn't make sense to kind of confuse the branding with, with our existing brand. So we officially split it off. And since we made that decision, We've had, uh, you know, hundreds of artists applying to to join our roster, so that's been kind of crazy. We're we're super backed up on submissions, so if anybody listening is, has submitted, please hang in there. We'll get through them eventually. But um, we made some announcements that we were accepting artist submissions, and we've just had uh, hundreds and hundreds of submissions. Um, but we've we've signed five, six about six or seven new artists since we opened up submissions um, and three or four of those are announced and we have another three or four uh, getting announced over the next month or so. What is the, I guess, a &R process like for you guys? I mean, obviously you have all these submissions. Is it like you and Clayton going through this? Is there like a singular person that does it? Like what is the process of, I guess, si finding and signing a new artist to f a label like Fixed? Yeah, it's been uh, a combination of things, but ultimately, Clayton, who, who you know, Seldwell or Scandroid, he owns the label. He and I co-founded together back in 2006, and everything that comes through the door passes through his filter. So a lot of times there's some pre-filtering from myself and, and a few of the other people on staff where we're hearing things as they come in. We something really catches our ear. We prioritize or highlight it to Clayton. Um, but as we've been really pushing to sign new artists, he's been digging through submissions, uh, you know, just kind of seeing what's coming in as well. And there's been things that have caught his ear that maybe you know one of us wouldn't have noticed. But um, but once we get it through his filter and it's like this is something we're interested in, then we have you know kind of a courting process of reaching back out, discussing, um, you know, we're, we're looking for artists that not only have great music, but, you know, are of, of similar mindset in, in, uh, in how they operate and making sure we're compatible that, you know, we're going to work well together. So we really vet out, um, personality, attitude, um, work ethic. And, you know, if they check those boxes, plus the music's great, um, we just start pursuing conversations and, you know, we've had something come together top to bottom, like a full multi-album long-term deal in literally a matter of days. And we've had it take months of back and forth and, you know, negotiations and, and 
and attorneys and going through, uh, you know, really detailed uh, notes. But, um, you know, really starts with great music. And is it a, is it a culture fit? Are they going to work well with us and vice versa? And these days when it comes to running a label like Fixed, when you're looking at new talent, are you looking at it from the perspective of multi-album, multi-year deals, or are you in the market more for singles? I've talked to a bunch of people lately and it seems like they're leaning towards doing the single route with artists. So what is your guys' approach to new talent? Is it different for every type of thing or is there something you're trying to do more in 2019? Well, it is kind of case by case, but historically we've only been long-term multi-album exclusive kind of everything deals which is you know kind of an older school mentality but that's really how we built um you know where we're at today over the last 12 years that we you know actually 13 years now that it's 2019 um but there has been a massive shift especially the last few years um towards more and more artists wanting to remain independent and you know we're an independent label, but there's so many tools now for people to go direct, and you know the tune cores and distro kids and CD babies and um, and even um, you know a big publisher like Cobalt has a, a program for independent artists where you retain your ownership and you can go through them. So it's gotten even more competitive for artists that want to remain as independent as possible. Um, so we have started doing some shorter deals. Um, we're starting to do some one-off deals on a case by case basis. Again, you know, if it makes sense and, you know, ultimately our goal is to be in long-term relationships with artists, but instead of asking them to marry us on the first date, you know, we're, we're now going, well, let's do a one-off. And if you like working with us, you know, we hope you'll come back and want to do more. So there's an artist that we're uh, getting ready to work with soon that is literally, you know, one EP. We're going to see how that goes. And then, uh, you know, just based on the relationship, hopefully they'll come back and want to do more. But um, just so far, the conversations we started with some artists where we've uh, um, approached that, hey, we could do this with a shorter commitment up front and explore it. There's been uh, a lot of, of good reception to that. And uh, yeah, so we're looking forward to just opening some new doors, uh, kind of evolving our deal structure. Um, but there's still artists that we also just recently signed that are multi-album where, you know, they've been a fan of Fixed for years or they, they completely see where we're going and they want to do a multi-album deal. So we're still doing those as well. Do you see one or the other being riskier? I mean, I guess inherently you would think the album one, but I guess what my idea is with albums, then you have at least the ability to kind of more develop the talent. The one-off EP is kind of like, well, if it works, it works, and if it doesn't work, it it doesn't work, and we can go our separate ways. Is there? Do you view it the same way, or is the risk kind of the same across the board? Yeah, I mean, there there we're we're structuring the deals differently in terms of a few factors, so you know. Obviously, if it's a one-off deal, we're not producing as many pieces of merchandise and thinking, um, you know, doing as much marketing spend, um, you know, into the artist. It's more just about that release. Whereas we have some artists that they're in multi-album long-term things. We're spending, you know, much more time developing them, investing in their brand beyond a specific release that, um, you know, is just them as an artist. So advertising merchandise and those things, as far as risk, um, I mean, doing a, a one-off release and, and doing, going deep on, uh, really investing into it for it to only be a one-off and then it could be done, um, you know, is a little bit riskier from where we're coming from, but that seems to be how a lot of labels are doing it especially in the EDM space, which we're not in a quote unquote EDM label, but it's, uh, you know, it's everyday practice for artists to be jumping from label to label, doing a single here, single there. Um, so, you know, it's kind of new territory for us. We'll see how it goes. We're, we're trying not to do, you know, just anything as a one-off, but, you know, artists that have some track record that, uh, 
that fit with what we're looking for, um, we're open to trying that. And then artists that are completely, you know, new, there's some, you know, very new developing artists that, you know, we're, we're making more of a long-term investment over multiple albums. Yeah, I remember reading a story with Marshmallow last year where he, where uh, maybe it was with Shalizi, his manager, where he said instead of signing a traditional record deal, they had signed a single deal with all of the major labels. And then we were going to do like one with each and see what came of each of those songs and how they were handled and then possibly move forward with a further deal from there. And I thought that that was, that's kind of a power move that you have to be at a certain level to make, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think... Uh, uh... I mean, there's, there's definitely, you know, artists that if, if they're, if they're just looking around, shopping around for, for, you know, the bigger, better deal and on that scale, we're probably not the right fit. Um, you know, we don't have the, the resources, you know, we're a small independent label in the grand scheme of things. Um, but I can see, you know, an artist at that size, you know, if they can play all the majors against themselves, I mean, more power to them, but, uh, but, you know, definitely. That's definitely not where we're at. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, there's, a lot of there's a lot of discussion these days about whether or not a label deal is even right for a lot of artists. I was reading a story today about how Spotify might be getting into this no album deals with artists where they aren't interrupting their, you know, their exclusive deal with, say, Warner Brothers or UMG, but they're somehow still signed to Spotify to do like their Spotify single sessions or do just they kind of have an exclusive lock on anything they might do in the streaming world. Um, what is the role do you see of fixed, you know, it, with developing artists and in like what is the value to an artist to joining a label like Fix? I know you mentioned you just signed some that had been following the label for years and. That's always a thing in the music industry. I, I remember working with artists when I first started out who were like, oh, we'd love to be on Hopeless Records or Victory Records because growing right. up I listened to bands on those labels. So that makes sense to me. But in terms of what your yep. role is in getting the artists out there and developing them beyond what someone could do for themselves, what does fixed, what, what is it that fixed helps them accomplish? Sure. Well, first off, I would say that I don't think, you know, a label deal is right for every artist. Um, I think there are depending on what the goals are and where they're going, it could make complete sense for an artist to remain independent. Um, but I think that that, you know, it also takes with it the artist being realistic about then they have to do everything themselves. Do they have a team to put around them to, you know, have the resources to really do it themselves? Um, but that's completely an option that is a hundred percent valid. Um, but with fixed, you know, what we have is we have developed a brand, much like you're saying, you know, Hopeless Records and Victory Records, you know, they have become brands that fans trust, that they have a sound, that the bands they're bringing on are, are going to cater to them. Um, and we've developed a, a brand around Fixed. There's not a, a lot of artists or, or labels doing the, the hybrid electronic rock style that we do. So we've become, you know, in a worldwide recognized label that makes that sound. And Clayton has really carved out a following for himself as Cell Dweller. And so there's a lot of artists and a lot of fans that follow him. And Fix has just become a brand that has some recognition and value um, for people to want to follow. And, you know, as far as specifics, you know, we have a community of fans that an artist can tap into day one versus, you know, going independent. Um, we have, have, you know, worldwide fan base. We have our own e-commerce store where there's already fans that like that kind of music coming to shop and we can introduce them to something. Um, so they can step right into a community. Um, you know, we've got Facebook groups and discord groups of fans that are, are connected. And so that's a big asset. Um, but then just, you know, kind of the, the traditional services that a label should offer. You know, we have playlisting and press and, and marketing. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we know how to do advertising. So we're doing, you know, digital ads, Facebook, Instagram ads. Um, we're pushing into gaming and influencers on YouTube and Twitch. And, you know, all of these assets that we set up just make it easier for an artist to come in without having to go do those themselves and, and kind of plug into the machine. So, 
you know, there's those specific things, but I think it really comes back to brand um, and just the value of branding. And, and we've invested, you know, 13 years now into fixed and, you know, we're, we're, we started over just a few months ago with a new brand with fixed neon, um, you know, carrying some of the equity that fixed is built, but transitioning it into this eighties uh, synth wave synth pop label. Um, but we're, we're going to be investing deep into that brand this year and putting a lot of marketing behind that and building a following for that specifically. That's a good answer, man. Well, keeping with our theme of 2019 here, thinking beyond the label, I'm curious, you've been in the industry for a while now, and I, I love getting your thoughts on these. What do you think are some of the trends or developments we're going to see in the industry this year? Like what's going to be the thing that we're all talking about, we're all doing, or maybe the thing that we stopped doing this year? What do you think are some of the <laughs> upcoming changes we'll see in 2019? Oh man, I think uh, I think streaming is going to continue to to gain massive market share as more and more people enter that ecosystem. I don't think it's ever going backwards. Um, so I think sales, you know, outside of niche items like vinyl or cassettes, which have made a resurgence um, for existing fans to want to collect, but as far as primary music consumption, I, I don't see sales you know, take, taking any share back. I think it's going to continue to, to landslide further into streaming. Um, but we're, we're making great money with streaming. So we fully support it. There's still how there's still debate out there from some artists or some labels that streaming doesn't pay enough. Um, you know, I don't know what they're doing, but, but we're, it's our number one digital revenue source. So we love streaming. I think as far as other trends, um, I think there's going to be more and more people, labels or artists venturing into podcasts, um, here on a podcast talking about podcasts, but, uh, we're, we're stepping our toe or kind of dipping our toe, uh, behind the scenes right now into a possible fixed podcast. Uh, so, you know, fixed fans might look out for something on that this year, but audio podcasts, uh, Voice control devices, you know, Alexa, Apple HomePod, Google Home, all of those are, are starting to shift the way people listen to music. I think that'll continue just more, more uh, consumption behavior around voice control devices. Um, yeah, those are a few things off the top of my head anyway. No, I have to agree with you about uh, a lot of those, if not all of those. I think the streaming thing is definitely going to be a big I, – I think we might see – the inevitable crest of streaming at some point this year. I think Apple Music will definitely grow a lot faster than Spotify, which will lead to like a billion think pieces about whether or not we've saturated the market with streaming services. But you touch on smart speakers there, which I think are kind of the, not the antidote, but it will help boost those streaming numbers. And they're like, well, there's already a ton of subscribers, but then it'll get into like how many devices they use it on and smart speakers are really gaining a lot of traction there. I think I read a report that we wrote about on the Holix blog back in November that people that live in homes with smart speakers listen to, mu listen to like 20% more music than they did before they had the smart speaker in their house. So it's leading to more consumption. Whether or not yes. that's whether or not that's meaningful consumption, I think, is a conversation that we have to have at a later point in time. You know what I mean? Because I, sure. I'll put on, you know, a, a playlist of just classic music that I really like that can just be in the background while I'm cleaning or while we're cooking or something like that. I don't know that it's that it's engaged listening, like what you get when you have headphones on or when you're even when you're in the car where it's kind of you're yep. paying attention to everything. It can be background music again, which is something that a lot of homes haven't had. There was that weird gap where we were all like, let's get rid of our stereo systems. And now, yeah. we're, now we're getting small stereo systems again. <laughs> yeah, I think that's totally valid. I think, you know, meaningful engagement or passive background listening is, is more needs to be spent on that. But I think it just, you know, for a label, um, more, listening time equals at least more chances that one of our artists or songs might get discovered. So, um, yeah, in, interesting thing to, to ponder exactly how that goes about, but, um, I, I'm absolutely for it. And then to your podcast point, it's funny. I was talking to Mike from alternative press not that long ago, and we both said the same thing that was more artists slash labels should do their own podcast. And it, and it goes with this trend we've been kind of following for a lot of years, which is, 
people are in an increasing number is turning to their favorite artists directly to get all the information they want about their artist. And it only makes sense, in our opinion, I guess, to fill the gap of when you're going to release something new with, well, every week there's something new or every month there's something new or a podcast they do while they're on the road or when they're off the road or whatever the theme happens to be. Even if yeah. it's something like there's this pop punk band Water Parks that does a podcast where they just read fan fiction that people write about their band. <laughs> That's amazing. And it's like, yeah, it's not like a serious, there's not really a lot of tour updates, but it's, it's like some piece of content that, you know, no blog would ever get away with doing that. And maybe once, but not having them do it on a regular basis. And it, and it helps them stay engaged with their audience. And I think it's such a low cost endeavor. Most artists already have a SoundCloud account or somewhere that you could host a podcast. So yeah, absolutely. the idea I of creating mean, it helps. Consistent engagement across social media or whatever piece of media that you can distribute to your audience is, I think that's so key and that's starting to differentiate, you know, active artists who are, are consistently engaging are just going to grow at such a, a higher rate. So we're, we're definitely investing into that line of thinking in 2019. Yeah, and I, I think it's just one of those, there are these interesting new, I guess, avenues to discovery appearing in music, and podcasting is a cool one because it, it can help older bands find a new audience because you have the opportunity to tap into a market where, I just, we just, last week's episode was with, um, uh, what is his name, Lee McKinney from Born of Osiris, and he was talking about how he had just started getting into podcasts, and he was amazed at how we had ever lived our life without them for so long. And he was talking about how the band is still finding new fans these days, and I couldn't help thinking that if they had their own podcast, there are probably metalheads out there who would rather listen to their favorite metal band talk about the act, the art of music, than talk listen to the guys from Metal Sucks or some other yeah. metal pod, metal website talk about it. Because this just you're in, for lack of a better term, they're in the shit. You know, they're they're actually doing it every day. They can speak to the experience and. Yeah. And for an artist that would ever consider, you know, going the GoFundMe route or going the crowdfunding route for their next album, a podcast, I mean, it just makes perfect sense. Yeah, building a following that they can engage with. And, you know, everybody complains about organic reach being limited on Facebook and Instagram. And, you know, the more you can build a following somewhere where you have built in reach. So if you got subscribers, to a podcast or to your YouTube channel, just, you know, it, it takes all of those platforms and your, your collective reach to really, you know, connect with the audience. Cause it's, it's so difficult if you build it on only one platform. Yeah. I wanted to talk to you about YouTube briefly because we recently launched a music biz channel on YouTube. I can't believe that name was still available. And uh, we uploaded every episode of Inside Music. This one will be on there. Someone might be listening to us talk about YouTube on YouTube right now. But I, I noticed that as soon as we uploaded every episode of the show, even the back ones, uh, Clayton's previous peer, Cell Dweller, has been on the show before. And his tracked really well. And I noticed that even on your guys' channel, you guys actually have a really strong YouTube community. So how have you gone about fostering that? And is it something that you guys are kind of actively focused on and trying to engage more with? Well, we've, we've kind of been on again, off again with YouTube, to be honest. We, you know, we put our music releases on our own channels. We have a label channel and, you know, a few of the artists that we directly uh, manage we manage all of Clayton's uh, projects in house. Um, so the things that we directly manage, we are getting all the music uploads onto those channels. And we've seen as consistent as we can be with keeping content coming on there, the channels grow. Um, but we've, we've really done not a great job uh, of that over the years. So that's something we've kind of refocused on uh, in the last few months and heading into 2019. We're, we're kind of doubling down on uh, a bunch of content that'll be upcoming. But something we've done specifically with Clayton is produced a lot of original content for YouTube. And we've seen the audience respond there and really engage with him. And, uh, you know, the more, I think that kind of goes for any platform, the more you cater content to a platform, then, you know, there's more of this, this, 
audience responding to it uh, in an authentic way. And, you know, so the Cell Dweller channel is at 175,000 subscribers or something like that. Um, and it's it, it's been a slow, constant build of just having consistent content over the years there. The label channel, we're going to be putting a lot more emphasis on this year and uh, producing some original content. So in addition to the songs going up or music or lyric videos, doing behind the scenes videos, doing uh, maybe our podcast series shows up on audio or video form on YouTube, as well as out to other you know, audio platforms. But we're, we're, we're looking at a lot more original content on a lot, lot of platforms uh, in addition to the music in 2019. That's good to hear, man. I, I like the advice you get. We are starting to create original content for our YouTube channel as well. It's a little nerve wracking because I spend a lot of time uh, hating other people's YouTube content. <laughs> yeah. More than I enjoy it. There's this guy, uh, Finn McKinty, who does a channel called Punk Rock MBA. Oh, I yeah, like. I know Finn. Uh, we worked with him actually. Oh, uh, yeah? Ago. Yeah. He's, uh, yeah. He makes really interesting videos, and every time I watch one, I'm like, I don't even know why. I'm going to try to do something on YouTube because this guy is cracking it so well. And uh, you know, he's like doubling down because he does, he does, he's really great. But I also don't know how much he monetizes his channel because he uses a ton of music. He does some great videos. For people that don't know, he does videos that are, some of them are industry editorials, like what happened to music blogs. But then he does things that are like, how did Green Day get famous? And it's like a 12 minute yeah. video that breaks down all the big parts of their career and how it changed things. And he uses like music clips and videos. And I'm just like, dude, how do you get the copyright clearance? For I, I think if I had to guess, I, I know where he's coming from. And uh, I think you could go uh, reference uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V as an influence potentially with him. But um, I think it's about uh, back to this word brand. My guess is, is he's not, not monetizing or the goal is not to monetize at all on YouTube, but he's building brand awareness and followers on with those videos that then will hire him to consult or for him to go, you know, give a speech at a music conference or something. Um, so I've, I've definitely seen his increased activity. Um, I know he's good friends with Joey Sturgis and I've seen Joey has, uh, started coming out strong with a lot more content as well. Um, and you know he's big in the you know the kind of warp tour all press world as a as a producer mixer uh, for asking Alexandria and and a bunch of those types of bands. Yeah, well, that actually makes a lot of sense. I I don't. I guess you do have to have that in mind when you go into it because I've spent the last month uh, we uploaded all the old episodes and I didn't even think about the copyright thing when we made them. Obviously, because you know, I was never like this is going to be on YouTube. The copyright thing is going to be an issue. And we uploaded a hundred and whatever videos that we had at the time, and I had to spend like two days clicking the copyright dispute button on like every single one of our videos. <laughs> and there were a few times where I got denied and I could reach out to the people because they use Holics or just because I know them personally and be like, Hey, could you cut me a break with this one? And just let me, like, I'm like, it's going to get like a hundred views. Calm down. Like I'm not going to steal. Yeah. But there were also a few where you, you, I learned a lot because I was like, I didn't realize this small band was had all their copyright work through this big group, but it, it has been an upwards battle where I'm like, is it worth fighting this? And it's something that we debate at Holics where it's like, well, if we want a YouTube channel, it would ultimately be good to monetize it in some way because if we're going to spend, yeah. you know, if we're going to spend, you know, an hour doing this podcast, an hour editing it, an hour making the video and then uh, uploading it and like three hours of work, like how do we get a return on that investment? Yeah. But at I, the same I, time, I, eh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I do think, um, and, and I could send you a couple of links uh, outside of this call, but um, that was my mindset for years was if it's on YouTube, we have to monetize it because we have the ability to monetize it. And I'm, I'm starting to think slightly differently for the first time in a long time that there are instances where you know, there might be some, some short-term money to monetize it, but if you forego that in certain instances, but it allows you to get a bigger reach, the brand value may come back later and, and far exceed the, the, what the short-term revenue may have been. So it depends on what you're what you're leveraging it to. But uh, you know, th there's definitely a path to uh, to bringing greater brand awareness that can pay off. Yeah, I, I'm hoping to give it a try. Like the first we're, the first piece that we're doing is a, a, a video 
that is taking it's something we did on the blog recently, which was highlighting this band called Heart Attack Man, who makes these really funny Twitter videos. And I've noticed that a lot of their video content they make for Twitter, they're just like little silly memes. They do huge numbers. And the band has maybe, let's say, 3,000 followers on Twitter. But some of their videos have gotten like 80 to 100,000 views because they end up going viral. And it's kind of the idea that there's a value to that that doesn't, like, there are probably people who know of that band without having ever heard their music because that was me. Like, I had to go out and seek out their music because I thought their videos were so funny. Um, and I wanted to use that as like a, as a video concept, but then I was like, all right, well then I got to figure out, am I going to use the band's music? You know, how do I make it that way? But I think you make a good point in that the, the balance of short term gain from what, whatever amount of views you get on the video itself to the brand recognition of, you know, promoting that artist and letting them have the copyright of it. And then you probably raise your chances of getting them or their label to share it because they know that they're making money off the video as well. Yeah, and that, that's even an, an interesting strategy right there. You get people to push it even further. <laughs> well, I, I do know that we got clearance from you guys, but I was like, some of, the, some of the times I had to send the copyright clearance, I literally wrote, because it asks you, like, is the uh, copyright owner aware of the video and then explain I, it? And I would write, like, this is literally a video with the person who made the copyright, who has the copyright, telling us <laughs> to use this song in this video, and we use that said song, which we name several times and it would still get refused yep. and i'd be like come on what is yeah. this <laughs> yep. well yeah no no issues from our end we'll uh if you get claims on anything you upload of ours just shoot me a link and i'll actually have the claim released within you know within a few hours well i, I appreciate that but beyond what we've talked about today is there anything else coming up in the near future for fixed music or fixed records that people should be on the outlook for i know you said the new artist announcements but like what is does clayton have anything going on is he just focused on the movie yeah right we now? uh 2019 we're gonna have new cell dweller so you know cell dweller is still our our, our cornerstone flagship artist um and we haven't had any new original Cell Dweller material for a couple of years. The last full-length album he did was um, a bit experimental to his typical sound. The last album was called Off World, and he did kind of you know shoegaze and stuff that he normally doesn't do. But this new Cell Dweller album, which uh, there'll be a new track out uh, in about a month from now, will be super heavy aggressive what any cell dweller fans that have been following him for any length of time have been waiting for so that will be a, a big 2019 uh focus for us and then yeah lots of new artists continuing to push fixed and now fixed neon um and we're going to be pushing uh just a lot of of new content and a lot of brand awareness um we've we really highlighted some of the things we're focusing on this year already uh, in this podcast. So just just doing that and you know showing up every day and and putting in the the day to day hustle and then stepping back and and waiting for the the long term results to to catch up with it. Well, that's exciting, man, and I'm thankful that you guys were able to find time to come back on the show, and I know that we're going to have a Fixed Artist The Annex on the show in a couple of weeks. Since uh, that is on the horizon, is there anything I should ask him? You tell us now, and people can look out for it in the episode, what we should talk to The Annex about. Yeah, he, uh, he just, over the last year, did a full-length album with us called Shadow Movement, and he we have a music video coming out in the next few weeks for... Uh, one of the songs on that album called Black Space. But then uh, just here in the next couple of months, he'll be starting in on the second album with us. And we'll be releasing singles every month leading up to a full length album by the end of the year. Um, but maybe something to, to ask him about is some of the custom music that we've just got him started on for film, TV and video game licensing. So he's doing a, a trailer music album and uh, there'll be some you know, material that fans uh, still sounds like the annex, but you know, instrumental cues for for games and movie trailers, and that's something totally new from him that they've not heard before. So we're excited for that to be coming out uh, sometime this year as well. 
That's really exciting, man. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. Like I said, this episode will be out this week, and it's on YouTube right now, along with all the other episodes of our show, and maybe we can find a way to collaborate on our YouTube channel with something else fixed related in the near future. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks for having me on, James, and uh, looking forward to sharing it out on, uh, on this end. Mm-hmm.